briefly like to i will uh, briefly uh, introduce our speaker uh, for this session uh, dr anu sharma uh, who is principal scientist at isri in center for agricultural bioinformatics uh, she is basically a computer scientist but uh, she is uh, uh, also doing research in bioinformatics and now she is dual faculty in isra dual means she is doing computer application research as well as bioinformatics based research and uh, her research interest includes uh, statistical software development web technologies uh, handling databases and data mining uh, she is involved in teaching also uh, various courses uh, uh, related to database management software engineering uh, oops uh, uh, related design operating systems meta genomic data analysis graph theory natural language processing and advanced computer programming in bioinformatics she has guided four uh, msc students so far in bioinformatics and computer applications and four are uh, also presently guiding uh, uh, out of which one is uh, two are phd students and two are msc students she has handled more than 10 research projects related to her area of research and uh, she has also visited iowa state university and um, got uh, 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 some awards for uh, her uh, presentations and some hindi competitions uh, and poster presentations she has also been uh, session co chair in md university and uh, published in very renowned uh, research journals uh, more than 30 35 papers uh, she has published so uh, we have invited her to give uh, us a brief uh, overview on bioinformatics as you all know bioinformatics is a emerging research area and uh, it is uh, some sense good as compared to uh, wet lab experiment of biotechnology so how it is being used what are various terms uh, so that will be explained by her so i invite uh, dr anu sharma now uh, for her lecture on overview of bioinformatics dr anu sharma uh, thank you dr uh, rashmi and uh, i am highly thankful to you Uh, for uh, giving such a nice introduction and uh, thank you ma'am and uh, good morning to all the participants okay, so now i think uh, we will start with the lecture uh, let me first uh, share with you the presentation that i have prepared for this lecture your slide is shared yes you can make it in full slide yes uh, i think it is uh, it is visible now yes true uh, so once again uh, good morning to all of you so as ma'am told you so today i will be you know sharing with you uh, some of uh, our experiences uh, that uh, we have accumulated in past uh, 10 years uh, by working in this area of bioinformatics as a rajni ma'am has already told you that i am a basically i am a computer scientist and uh, uh, in 2010 after the establishment of center for agricultural bioinformatics and uh, now this is uh, renamed again uh, now the name has uh, been changed to division of agricultural bioinformatics uh, so uh, from 2010 onwards uh, uh, we started working in the area of the bioinformatics okay so from uh, past i can say from past 10 to 12 years uh, i am working in this area and uh, although uh, from a non biological background uh, we have you know uh, gathered uh, or we have learned some of the information uh, on this topic and basically uh, you know i started working uh, in this area uh, uh, with the you know identification of uh, this mirnas and uh, right now uh, i am working in the area of the metabolic 
books. So there we are trying to apply uh, all the you know various bioinformatics uh, tools and technologies uh, to extract the useful information from the metagenomics data. So uh, as we know that the uh, this topic of today's lecture is the overview of bioinformatics. So what are the opportunities uh, which are there and what are the challenges uh, that we have to face in the coming futures? So let me first, you know, start with the introduction. So, you know, let me first uh, uh, clarify the meaning of this term uh, bioinformatics. And now uh, we all of us knows that uh, in today's, uh, you know, scenario, uh, we are, you know, interchangeably using these two words, bioinformatics and computational biology. And actually these uh, words, these two words, they are used uh, interchangeably, but there is, uh, we can say, a slight change in the meaning of uh, these two terms. The first one is the bioinformatics and the second one is the computational biology. So, uh, you know, uh, the question, uh, one uh, thing that I would like to share with you is that okay, from the past few decades, the amount of biological information is increasing exponentially. So all of you, I think uh, uh, you must be very aware of the fact that the, a lot of uh, sequence data is now generated. So earlier, the, there is a, the amount of uh, the sequence data which is generated is very limited. And there were many factors which are uh, attributed to the scene. And one of the major factor was the high cost which was involved in sequencing of the, uh, this biological data. But now uh, with the passage of the time, the cost of sequences has uh, reduced. And uh, due to this fact, a lot of information uh, is now generated. So there is, we can see, a kind of an explosion of uh, this uh, uh, biological information. So earlier, uh, what was there? Earlier, we were uh, doing this uh, biological research uh, mostly in the labs. But as uh, the amount of information the, which is available to us, it, uh, it grows, the need for handling such information, it arises. And uh, if we go back, at the same time, there was a uh, you know, again, uh, in the parallel, uh, uh, and parallelly, there was a, a major developments that took place in the area of the computer science. And the uh, same thing we can uh, say about the computers that earlier the cost of the hardware was very high, so their usage was uh, very limited. But as the cost of the hardware, it comes down, now it has become uh, very easy. And uh, now all of us know that uh, all of us are uh, doing or using computers for most of our tasks. So, uh, so uh, these two parallel, uh, you know, uh, uh, technological changes, they lead to uh, the need of applying the uh, concepts of computer science on the uh, data which is uh, generated from the biological sciences. So these two uh, things, they combine together. All of you, please mute yourself. Up. All of you mute yourself. There is a problem. A uh, lot of noise is coming at the background. Anu, you can continue. Okay. So these two, you know, uh, these two parallel developments, they lead to the, uh, you know, development of uh, new uh, disciplines, which we call as the bioinformatics and another thing is the computational biology. So basically, what is the difference between uh, bioinformatics and computational biology? So in the case of uh, uh, bioinformatics, we are applying. So we can say it is a combination of biology and computer science. This is what we, and other uh, interdisciplines also. So this is their bioinformatics. And what is the computational biology? The computational biology is using the, this is the combination of computer science and biology. So basically this is the basic difference between computational biology and bioinformatics. So biologist who is specialized in the use of computational tools and system to answer the questions of the biology, they are known as the biologists. And on the other hand, the computer scientists, mathematicians, statisticians, and engineers who are specialized in information theory,
So uh, this is the difference between a computational biologist and a bioinformatics. Uh, my is my screen moving? Yes. Uh, okay, I think I am on second. I am on the first slide. Fine. So uh, this the actual process of analyzing and interpreting the data is referred to as the computational biology. So this is the definition of the computational biology. So this is the another you know uh, picture that clearly shows what is the bioinformatics. As we can see from this picture, that bioinformatics is basically a central discipline, okay. and this discipline is basically linked with many other disciplines. For example, it is linked with the molecular biology. It can uh, take the input from the genetics. It can take the input from biochemistry. Uh, the input from biophysics can uh, go into this in bioinformatics. Similarly, evolutionary biology, agricultural sciences, mathematical and statistical sciences, pharmaceutical sciences, and omics. That is a lot, uh, the large amount of the omics data. So, the bioinformatics here it is at the center of all these disciplines, and the data which is generated from the experimental, uh, from the experiments which are conducted in the, the different type of disciplines, uh, they can combine. Uh, in this new discipline, which is the bioinformatics. And uh, we can see these are the supporting uh, disciplines which are playing a very active role in the development of this uh, discipline of bioinformatics. The first uh, discipline which is playing an active role is the computer science. The another thing is the information technology. Then we have database management systems and the computational resources. So this is a very you know good diagram which shows uh, the actual nature of the bioinformatics. So we can say that bioinformatics is a central discipline which is linked with many disciplines of the science. And these disciplines of science and technology, they provide the infrastructure and indisciplinary nature to bioinformatics. So uh, in the uh, science disciplines, several traditional and advanced subjects, they are associated with the bioinformatics. For example, uh, uh, this plant sciences, it can be combined with bioinformatics, animal sciences, molecular biology, genetics, evolutionary biology, pharmaceuticals, mathematical and statistical sciences, and omic sciences. And besides, uh, in the support system, bioinformatics is now closely related with the other disciplines like computer science, information technology, computational resources, because and all these disciplines, they serve as the backbone for providing the uh, this discipline of bioinformatics. Uh, anu, so, are yeah. you one minute, Anu? Are huh? you uh, are you logged in with from two devices? Uh, yes, yes. I think uh, there is one more person, Jyotika. I have sent her link also because I think uh, if the time uh -huh. permits. Uh, but she is can... not in. She is not in your room, right? Yes, yes. She is not in my room. Okay, I thought it, the disturbance is coming because of that. Okay, okay, no issue. Oh, she is now muted? Uh, no, no, uh, that's fine. Uh, only thing is we are getting lots of disturbance. So but I, I, uh, I could not, I'm not seeing, uh, I'm not uh, listening any of the disturbance. For me, it's uh, okay. Okay, okay, fine, fine. Okay, okay. Okay. So, so hmm. It's fine. Uh, maybe uh, there, there are two devices in your system. In your room, sorry. Up you, then. Okay, okay. In my so, room, it is not. It's fine. Some participant must be having. I am requesting all the participant to please mute yourself. Therefore, these scientific disciplines and support system, they are combining to build a new discipline, uh, which is called as the bioinformatics, for decading the intricate problems uh, which are linked to the biological systems. Okay, there are many problems which are, uh, you know, intrinsic to the biological systems only. So what we are doing here, we are applying these information technology, computer science, and this mathematical sciences and statistical sciences to solve these problems in an innovative manner. Okay. Uh, with the processing due to the involvement of computer science and IT. So there is a lot of development which took place in the area of computer science and IT. And now we are applying 
these uh, innovations uh, to uh, solve the problems which are intricate to the biological sciences. So let me take you uh, back to the history of bioinformatics. So this, you know, this term bioinformatics, it was first coined by a researcher, Paulian Hogbeth. Okay. And uh, this uh, term, it was first coined uh, very late back in the year of 1970. And actually, uh, uh, you know, after they used this word in the year 1970, and uh, in the 1978, this, uh, paper, this word actually appears in a research paper, uh, which is published by Pollen and uh, Ben Haspel. And what they have done, they have uh, performed some study they have performed the information processes of the bio, uh, this uh, biotic systems. They were working on this kind of research, and uh, what they felt that uh, these biotic systems they carry some kind of information, and uh, 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 so they coined a new word bioinformatics. But uh, but still at that time the use of uh, this term uh, was uh, not very frequent because at that time uh, they were. Uh, very limited amount of uh, biological data which was available and on the similar line the uh, on the in the field of computer science also uh, there were uh, not uh, so many advancements so this was the first you know use of this word bioinformatics by pollen so again uh, what led to this um, uh, this uh, evolution of this particular area of bioinformatics basically it is uh, started early in the early years of 1960s uh, okay with the you know um, some uh, new inventions in the biological or life sciences so this idea was generated that the macromolecules uh, all of information because they are actually expressed uh, in a in an organism but later on it was uh, they they found that uh, these uh, dna uh, deoxyribose nucleic acid and rna they also carry a very useful information and there is a need to decode the information or to extract the information which is uh, uh, present there in the uh, dna and rna so earlier it was thought that DNA is nothing but it is the sequence of uh, four nucleotide characters like ATGC. But uh, you know the pattern of these ATGC it plays a very important role uh, in understanding some particular kind of uh, processes and uh, uh, this uh, genetic information. So this idea was originated that the, these macromolecules like the DNA and RNA they carry very important information and there is a need to study this information. So another, uh, another area that lead to this uh, bioinformatics is that uh, the collection of the amino acid sequences which are available, uh, they uh, increased. So again, this uh, uh, you know, uh, pointed that there is a need for uh, the generation of this. Uh, uh, there is a need for applying the computer science or information sciences in this particular area. And as we all know that uh, there is a increase in the high speed digital computers so all these things they combine and give rise to the new field which is your bioinformatics so this margaret uh, day hop she is the first uh, bioinformatician and we call her as the uh, mother and father of the bioinformatics so the, her major contributions in this area that she is a pioneer in the application of computational methods in the field of the biochemistry <laughs> And uh, she was the first, uh, you know, person who developed a computer program, which is the com protein, uh, for the determination of protein primary structure using the advent degradation method of peptide sequence. So this was the first reported tool or a program which is specifically dedicated to the bioinformatics, uh, to the biological sciences. So again, uh, her another major contribution of her is that uh, that she developed the one letter amino acid group. So amino acid is basically represented by the three nucleotide sequences and she gave a one letter code uh, to the amino acid and this is a very popular code which is still we are using and she is the one who published the atlas of protein sequences and structure in 1965. So 
this was a brief about the what is bioinformatics and what is the history of the bioinformatics so now uh, we are living in the area of we can see uh, in silico uh, biology if you look at this uh, you know picture it is clearly shown that earlier what uh, we were doing uh, we were uh, performing all our these experiments and studies in the laboratory and uh, all the experiments that we were uh, performing or doing in the laboratories it leads to the generation of the uh, a lot of data and due to this there was a need to store them in a uh, or need to store process them and analyze them using the uh, computational methods okay. and again when the computational methods tools specific tools uh, they are available with us it leads uh, it again aid to our experimental uh, you know uh, experiments that we are conducting in the uh, lab so there is this is a kind of a cycle that we have in to the in nowadays so uh, we are uh, this uh, a lot of data which is generated from these uh, uh, biological experiments it is now analyzed and processed in using the tools and there are many tools uh, databases and uh, uh, you know methods which are there and we are using all these methods to uh, find the some new uh, you know innovative uh, uh, possible uh, uh, you know information and this information we can uh, validate in our lab so uh, so this is a kind of a cycle so now we are living in the age of uh, in silico biology so what we are doing before conducting the actual uh, wet lab experiments we are you know uh, trying to uh, you know do this in a uh, uh, in, in 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 silico uh, uh, on a computer system by using the available databases and tools so we can say that the biology is now becoming a quantitative science and uh, there is a transformation from observational to experiment so earlier what we were doing we were just observing the something uh, some process to uh, identify some uh, to uh, uh, to reach to some conclusions and from observational we moved on to the experimental part and now this experimental part it lead to the generation of a lot of data so now we are applying uh, you know techniques of data sciences uh, in the uh, biological sciences so uh, we can see so there are uh, all these new discoveries they require the large data set and advanced analytical methods so th this is one of the very you know uh, a great opportunity that exists in today's biological sciences that there is a great need of large data sets and advanced uh, analytical method for processing of the biology okay so this is a, a graph that shows you the growth of the biological data so this is a you know this is a data which is compiled and uh, this information uh, is taken from this forbes.com and in this uh, graph uh, the data up to 2019 is shown here so uh, so here uh, we are showing the timeline and this is the cost of sequencing the uh, cost of sequence so you can see from here is that in the 2002 the cost of sequencing was very high so a lot of money uh, was involved when we are going for the sequencing of any uh, any subject of our interest or any organ so you can see from this graph that there is a continuous decline in the cost uh, with the time so now you can see uh, after from around this 2019 the cost of sequencing has reduced to uh, only a thousand dollars so that means now we can uh, sequence uh, with the uh, with the availability of the sequencing technologies uh, we can uh, sequence at a very low cost which is around only one thousand dollars so that means we can sequence more so and similarly you can see from here the number of the genomes which are sequenced in the 2012 a very a very there is a small number of the genomes uh, which is sequenced as you can see now that a large number of approximately 1.5 million uh, genome sequencing are available to us so this is the power of the you know now you can see from here is that a lot of uh, the amount of the biological data which is available now is increasing exponentially 
so this genomic data has increases exponentially now we have with us a lot of the data so definitely there is a need for a development of the databases tools techniques methods application of artificial intelligence artificial application of deep learning techniques application of supervised unsupervised methods uh, for handling uh, all these kind of data so we are not stopping the sequencing and now we are generating uh, tons of the data and uh, also uh, all these developments they have created they have created many jobs in the last few years so uh, just uh, this is a slide that uh, that is showing you that the amount of there is an exponential increase in the amount of the data which is generated every day so let us come to the uh, how, what are the biological processes which are leading to the development of this biological data so we know that at the base we have a dna dna stands for the uh, deoxyribose nucleases so the uh, we can see the if we are sequencing the dna that it leads us to the genome sequence okay that means the combination of atgc if we are uh, you know sequencing it then the type of the data that we are getting is the genome sequence and uh, this is a kind of this diagram is again related to the central dogma of the life so uh, this dna it uh, uh, it transcribed to form the rna okay so now uh, this rna dna is converted to the rna so when we sequence the rna part so we get the rna sequence so in this case so this is another type of the data here we have the genome sequencing and then we can have so have the rna sequencing and this uh, rna sequence it undergoes the process of translation to uh, form the proteins so proteins to be are the actual uh, you know uh, things which are expressed in an organism so this is this leads to the another type of the data which is your protein part okay after the translation we get protein so after we can uh, have the data about the protein sequences as well as the structure now each uh, uh, we have we can have the sequence of the proteins and these proteins they have a specific structure two type of information is there uh, with respect to the proteins protein sequences as well as that of the structure so we can have uh, information about protein sequences and structures now these proteins do have, these proteins they play some A role in some kind of biological function. Okay. So what we can do, we can annotate the function of uh, these proteins. That this particular protein is playing this role in this particular process. So the, another type of information which is available to us is the protein function annotation. And also, one protein it might interact with another protein in uh, a particular. in in performing a one particular function so this type of information can also be there and another type of information might be a protein it might interact with the dna in uh, any of the uh, biological processes so these are the various processes which are occurring within the organisms and due to all these uh, pro biological processes a uh, different type of information is generated at the dna uh, we are getting the genome sequencing at the you know this rna level we are getting rna sequencing at the protein level we are having the protein sequences and structures and uh, then we are having the information about protein expression protein function annotation and protein protein and protein uh, dna interaction so uh, so uh, this is the type of the biological data which is generated so in the previous slide i told you about the various biological processes so corresponding to those biological processes the different type of uh, biological data uh, that we may have is the genomic data it corresponds to the dna sequences and then we can have the proteomic data now this proteomic data it is related to the protein sequences or protein structures or we can have the pathway data Uh, so this uh, data it corresponds to the various pathways which are involved in a one particular uh, process we can have the taxonomic data taxonomy is basically you know arrangements so where the where we have categorized the organisms in a tree format okay i think uh, most of us have studied this uh, taxonomic classification in the 
in our school days. Uh, so basically, this type of data uh, is there in the biological census. And now, uh, you know, there is one more type of data which is available uh, is the metagenomics data. So again, this is a new field. And uh, this uh, word metagenomics, it was uh, coined by the Handelman. So uh, basically, what is the difference between genomics and uh, metagenomics is that in the genomics, uh, we are mainly concerned with single organism. We are studying about a single organism, for example, uh, you all of you might have uh, heard about the human genome project. So in that uh, in that project, uh, you know the efforts were uh, you know efforts were applied on sequencing of the human genome. Okay, so uh, so this is the genomic data that we are uh, that we generated. Because here the only offer is similar and similarly uh, a lot of data is now generated on different crops like we have the uh, genomic data for all the rice. Everything is uh, now available. Now, what is the difference between genomics and metagenomics? The difference is that in metagenomics, we take an environmental sample. For example, suppose we have uh, you know taken a sample of you know animal gut. Now, uh, all of us know a number of microorganisms they are present in the human gut. And uh, for example, if you take the example of a human. Uh, uh, human in case of human also suppose uh, uh, apne, what you have uh, done uh, you are performing a kind of the biopsy and uh, you have you took some uh, tissue sample so in that tissue a number of microorganisms are present so that the uh, the uh, dna which is extracted for some such uh, uh, samples it uh, consists of many organisms so in metagenomics uh, what you are doing with you are not dealing with a single organism but now uh, you are dealing with the multiple organisms at the DNA level. So this is basically the difference between the genomic and the metagenomics. Okay. So the, here what uh, I tried is, I tried to emphasize uh, on the type of the biological data which is available. So these are the different type of data that are available. Okay, so now a, a lot of different varieties of data is available. So there is a great need for having the biological databases. Okay, so a biological database is a database having collection of uh, biological and other related information. Now, uh, these biological databases, they are used at different stages of uh, life sciences research. For example, to deposit the raw data. For example, uh, so whenever we are conducting an experiment and uh, some suppose new sequence is there, so what we can do, we can uh, submit that sequences in the available biological databases. Now the another need for this is to uh, store uh, an interpretation of the experiment. So this type of information can also go into the biological databases. And uh, the results of the analysis processes, uh, they can again become a part of the biological data. Now search for matching the structures and sequences. So again, this is a part of the biological databases. So this, uh, we can say that these databases, they are an important tool to assist the scientists and the researchers. So uh, a different, uh, we can uh, we have seen that a lot of, uh, you know, a type of biological data is available and this has given rise to the uh, need for having the biological databases. So now, uh, based upon the uh, type of uh, the data which is available to us, uh, we, we have various types of databases uh, in case of your biological sciences. We have two types of databases. Uh, okay, the first one is the primary databases and another is the secondary databases. Now, what is the difference between primary database and secondary database? Now, this primary database is the sequence of nucleic acid or proteins. Okay. And what is the secondary database? It contains the results after the analysis of the primary data. If uh, on, in this particular primary data, some kind of analysis is being applied, so the results that we got, they are stored in the secondary databases. So this is basically, this is a, you know, a process that shows the generation and dissemination of our databases. So here you can see that, uh, uh, suppose uh, this is the biological experiment which is conducted. But of this experiment, it may lead to the generation of the data. And once the data is uh, available to us, uh, it can be stored in the databases. Okay, it is stored. Now, this databases, they are now accessible to, you know, 
uh, web uh, web uh, is accessible through websites through a network and uh, uh, this uh, client and uh, server technologies so we can access uh, all these databases which are developed so these biological databases they are the we can say a special kind of uh, databases uh, which are uh, there uh, for which are very specific to biological data so these are the different uh, again categories of biological databases we have sequence database and structured database so in this uh, I, I told you that uh, uh, in proteins uh, we have uh, protein sequences the proteins they have sequences as well as the structure so we have uh, specifically designed databases which are dedicated for storing the structure of the database so uh, if you come to the sequence database then the, this uh, sequence database is now again divided into the primary database and the secondary database so the primary protein uh, database is your swiss prop this is pir and uh, trmp so these are uh, you know specific uh, databases that we can access uh, to handle the uh, to uh, access the protein information and if regarding this nucleic acid uh, we have the databases like genbank bdg bj emba and now uh, you know some kind if we apply a kind of the processing on these uh, uh, primary databases a new database is there protein databases pdb is there which is now a uh, uh, which is again the sorry uh, the primary database of a structure of protein is your PDB and the SCOP and CAT these are the secondary databases okay and other uh, related to protein and other secondary databases related to protein they are PFAM, block and prosite so this is uh, basically uh, an overview of uh, categories of the biological databases so. Uh, uh, huge uh, database uh, of mainly sequencing uh, the data pouring in from many genome sequencing projects. So data uh, in uh, into these uh, databases is coming from many sequencing projects. And uh, these databases, they are a very important tool for the scientists and uh, researchers to understand and explain the biological phenomena. So you can see uh, here, uh, these are the biological databases. For example, we have a bibliographic database. It contains the information about the literature, okay, research papers, which is available. An example of uh, this type of database is Medline and PubMed. And uh, another type of biological database is the taxonomic database. Now, this database contains the information, classification information, that uh, how a particular organism is classified in the uh, tree of life. So, example is the taxonomy browser species 2000. These are some of the uh, examples of the taxonomic databases. Then we have nucleic acid databases. They contains the DNA information. And these are the very important databases uh, which are used by researchers and bioinformaticians. And, uh, you know, the example of these databases uh, is NCBI, EMBL, and DDBG. And another is the genomic databases, and they contain uh, information about the genes. After, uh, you know, uh, using the, uh, this uh, DNA information, we can get the information about the gene. And some examples of just gene level information is the ensemble uh, ecosic flybase. And uh, we have the protein databases, which contains the uh, information about the proteins. And examples are Uniprot and Swissprot. And the uh, biological databases dealing with protein families, domain and functional sites. Uh, and this databases, they contain uh, information about the classification of proteins, identifying domains, and examples are ProSite, PFAM, and PRIPS. And the uh, biological databases, which deals with enzymes and metabolic pathways, is CAG. This is, again, a very important uh, database, which is used, I think, almost by every bioinformatician. So these are the, you know, uh, databases which are invariably used by all the researchers uh, which are working in this area of bioinformatics. So this is basically, uh, here I am trying to show is to you the NCBI uh, database. This is developed by the National Center for Biotechnology Information uh, in the U.S. So what is there in the worldwide, uh, these, we have three main uh, nucleotide databases uh, maintaining agencies. The first one is the NCBI. 
So you can see uh, here uh, that uh, uh, this website, it contains the information, genomic information. Okay. So here you can submit your data, you can download the data, you can download the API, you can analyze the data. Okay, a, a lot many options are available here at the, uh, from this NCBI website. Now, uh, we have another website, which is uh, your EMBL website. Now, this NCBI website it is maintained uh, in USC, and uh, this is the European Molecular Biology Laboratory, EMBL. Uh, now, this website uh, is maintained, this database, EMBL database is maintained in Europe. Okay. So these are we can we can say these are uh, we have three uh, you know model agencies which are maintaining the biological information or data. First one is NCBI, then we have EMBL, and uh, from Japan we have uh, DDBJ. Okay, this is the bioinformatician and uh, this DDGBA center. It provides sharing and analysis service of data from life sciences research and advanced sciences, and this is uh, you know maintained in the Japan. So these are the three important uh, or major, you know, resources uh, uh, of biology information. Now we can see from here this case we have uh, three nodal, uh, you know, databases. Here uh, one is uh, GenPen, then we have DDGB and MBL. So some of some are submitting your data in this uh, NCBI and some are studying in the. Uh, some are depositing in DDGBA and some are depositing in EMBA. So what uh, what important point is there that these three uh, databases, they are integrated with each other and they uh, actually collaborate with one another. So in case one sequence is submitted in the uh, one database, then automatically it is reflected in the other database. So basically what they are trying to do is they are they have integrated them so that at one point of time uh, only the latest information will be available to the user so all these uh, international sequence databases they are collaborating with each other for example gen bank if there is a change in the gen bank automatically it will be reflected to the mba well and then ddgb similarly if there is a change in this ddgb automatically it goes like this so now we can see from here is there are various uh, this NCBI is doing this and here the nodal agency is CIB and this is the EBI and uh, these enters it so again you can submit and get the updates from NCBI you can submit your sequences and get the updates from CIB and you can perform the submission of your sequences and uh, retrieve the information from EBI Okay, and these, uh, you know, these are the, uh, you know, utilities or services, NPZ, uh, get uh, entry and uh, SRS. So these are, we can say, uh, services, uh, web services or Windows services, uh, any kind of server, uh, this is, we can say, uh, computer services, which is provided by all these agencies uh, to deposit the data and to update the data. And uh, basically, this is dealed by NIH, National Institute of uh, Health and uh, NIG and then the European Molecular Biology Laboratory. Okay. And these are again uh, the set of tools which can be used while submitting and the information, for example, sequin uh, and blanket, they are used by NCBI and Sakura is used by your uh, this uh, DDG. So the main point here is uh, that all these three important databases, they are collaborating with each other uh, so that the user uh, get the updated information on this. So this is one of the major challenge and opportunity that uh, you know that is there in case of your uh, biological databases. The first thing is that the first issue is that uh, the type of uh, uh, very heterogeneous uh, type of information is uh, uh, generated, and uh, so there is a need to integrate them. Okay, uh, so there is a need to integrate this information at one place so that uh, we can collaborate with each other. Okay, so there is a need uh, for the collaboration. So there is a, there is a collaboration of all these uh, international sequence databases. So this is uh, another you know uh, database which is the CAG. Now it contains the information about the high level function and utilities of the biological system. 
this is the Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genes and Genome. And again, this is uh, maintained and developed by uh, developed in Japan. So this is again a very important database which is available to the bioinformaticians uh, to carry out their task. So these are some of the important databases that I've shared with you. So we can see the type of the information is uh, very different uh, in these databases and also uh, different type of databases are developed at different point of time so one of the issue is there that there is a need for integrating the databases this we have uh, discussed so these are some of the issues and challenges which are there so we can see that data generation is there at many places but they are not connected with each other so there is a need uh, to provide a single point access to all the biological information which is being generated and multiple comparison issues. So uh, this is again a very important issue. Okay, suppose uh, we are performing a, a comparison with the one database. So if the database is a different place, then we have to perform this uh, comparison part at multiple places. Okay, so uh, again, uh, this need a solution uh, from the uh, computer scientist and the uh, information scientist. And another important, uh, you know, point is that the, the dimensionality of the biological data is very high. So if the dimensionality of the biological data is very high, then uh, obviously the processing of this type of data will take a lot of time. So uh, we should apply, you know, statistical techniques and uh, some other type of uh, methods so that uh, we can reduce the high dimensionality of the biological data. And uh, so that uh, we can get the, um, the results with the less time and uh, less resources. Another thing is uh, the currently the high throughput sequencing technologies which are generating this biological data, they have, uh, you know, they have many noise which is associated with it. So uh, due to the presence of noise in this uh, sequencing data, the results that we are getting, they are, uh, you know, somewhat not uh, that much accurate. So we, they, we need uh, some kind of techniques so that we can, uh, you know, uh, deal with the noise which is there, there in the high throughput biological data. So another issue that needs to be is the integration of multiple heterogeneous biological databases. So these are some of the issues and challenges which are there in case of the biological databases. So uh, I, you know, I discussed about this uh, metagenomics part. Uh, yes. So again, uh, again, I will, uh, you know, emphasize on this metagenomics part. So from now we have moved from genomics to the metagenomics. So in this uh, genomics, it started with the, you know, a sequencing of uh, this E. coli in 1997 and uh, in 2001, the human genome was sequenced. So here what we were, uh, we were uh, dealing only with the single genome. Okay, but now what is there in case of uh, metagenomics? We are now, uh, we are now dealing with the multiple organs. For example, suppose you can take the sample from the water or you can take the sample from the soil and uh, as we all know that um, there are a number of microorganisms which are there in this uh, water and uh, for example, we can take the sample from human gut. So number of the organism is uh, more than or we can say thousands. So this is uh, the uh, metagenomics part of this. So uh, what is metagenomics? It is the study of uh, genetic material which is recovered directly from the environment. So metagenomics is the application of uh, modern genomic techniques to the study of communities of uh, microbial organisms directly in their natural environment. For example, we are taking the uh, sample uh, from the human gut and then we are going for the sequencing of it. So we are bypassing the need for the isolation and lab cultivation of the individual species. So this is a relatively a new area of the research uh, in the bioinformatics. Okay, so uh, this is the metagenomic analysis. Suppose, uh, you know, we took this soil sample so, and we performed the sequencing of it. So after the sequencing, we get something like the, this ATGC, ATGC, ATGC. So once this sequence information is available to us, then we have to move on to the assembly. Okay, now this assembly, uh, after the assembly of uh, this sequencing data, we can uh, have with us the context and scaffold. And once uh, we have with us the context and scaffold, then we can move on uh, for the exonomic characterization. 
for example this first one it belongs uh, now i have shown earlier all were shown in the black color now i have marked some of them in the red color and some in the back, uh, in the blue color and some in the uh, green color so that means they are now different from each other in case of genomics all are from the single color that they are from the single organism but now you can see uh, uh, that this might show that the sample it may contain uh, three organisms the red uh, you know sequence it represent one uh, organism and this um, green one it represents the another organism and the blue one it represents the a uh, different kind of organisms and once we uh, have done this taxonomic characterization then we can perform the things like annotation uh, gene prediction functional annotation and process level annotation using the databases so this is the uh, metagenomics part so uh, this is a these are the basic you know tasks that we want to perform uh, during any metagenomics data analysis the first point of interest is that we want to know that uh, who is there that means uh, which organism is present in the sample okay once uh, we know that this particular organism is present in the sample the next thing is that uh, we have to find out what they are doing okay so this this basically deals with the functional profile and once we have done this after we can go for for this that what does it all means this is the statistical analysis so this is uh, basically the metagenomics data analysis task that we uh, wish to perform okay so i will you know skip uh, these uh, but i think we are already approaching the time so i will skip these slides and uh, Okay, so this is just uh, one work that I would like to share with you that we have performed the computational com uh, comparison of metagenome assemblers which are available. Okay, this again I will skip. So now I will uh, discuss. Uh, I would like to share with you that uh, you know a lot of uh, information is uh, biological information is now developed, and uh, to deal and to uh, to deal with uh, this kind of uh, biological information, Ashoka, a supercomputing hub for omic knowledge in agriculture, is established at ICR ISRI. Okay, and this facility is available to all the researchers uh, in the national agricultural research systems, and they can uh, use this facility to analyze their biological data. Okay, so this Ashoka is the you know grid. This is uh, for supporting the biotechnological research in the agriculture. Now this hub it consists of a hybrid high, uh, hardware architecture of Linux and Windows cluster, and this is distributed over six national institutions across the country to form the national agricultural bioinformatics grid so this is basically the configuration of the ashoka that it now consists of 30 node linux cluster with two master 16 nodes hadoo cluster with one master 16 node dp gp gpu cluster with one master one smp of 60 cores with 1.5 terabyte ram and one SMP of 128 cores with uh, 1.5 terabyte RAM. Then uh, a lot, uh, a number of uh, web applications and databases they are installed on this server. And now, in order to access uh, this particular Ashoka facility, one biocomputing portal is also developed at ICR ISRI. For users, uh, they can uh, you know uh, uh, get an account, they can create an account on this uh, biocomputing portal, and then they can perform uh, uh, you know various type of uh, uh, analysis, biological uh, analysis part they can perform. So. Uh, you know, it provides various type of services. For example, application services it is providing, the grid information services they are provided, user authentication services, data management services, and email notification. Used. So this is uh, about the you know uh, brief of the. Um, you know, bioinformatics structure which is uh, available at the ISRI and it is open for the researchers in the National Agricultural Research System. And uh, I think now we have uh, Jyotika with us. Uh, Jyotika, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Now uh, she will, uh, she will, you know, take you through some of the, uh, I think one of the databases like NCPI. Huh? Yes. Yeah. 
You can just take one, okay? NCBI okay. or one or two. I think that we have we are uh, only we have five minutes more. Okay, ma'am. I will uh, speak about NCBI only. Yes. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, you have to unshare your screen. Then only I can share. Yes. Uh, so this is one of the uh, main database NCBI. National Center for Biological Information. It has been run by um, US. Uh, this is a, a main primary uh, database, database and uh, it has uh, another N number of databases concerning with the assembled data, the, uh, the one that uh, we receive after sequencing, the assembly files, uh, the bio collections, some projects, the assembly projects, uh, a few bio samples, the database on few bio samples. They are a database, or they are also having database for books. Means all the biologically uh, biological books they uh, they have collected here. There are certain uh, database for the clinical trials uh, uh, that have been going on in the world. They they have uh, this conserved domain database. Uh, there is a certain databases on uh, the variants, uh, the gene. There are few databases on the uh, genome also, the, the complete genome, the one uh, whose species, whose genome has been completely sequenced. Uh, uh, we have the repository here. There are some uh, gene uh, uh, geo data sets, uh, uh, geo profiles like the microRNA data and all. Uh, we have certain and uh, databases on identical protein groups. So this NCBI has a, a long list of databases, means these all we can consider as a uh, secondary databases to the sequences that we are generating here. The nucleotide databases is here, the protein databases are here, and uh, the, um, the literature database PubMed is over here. Uh, there are various databases on uh, the variant callings like SNPs, uh, uh, and uh, we have our fast fast queue files in a SRA, the sequence retrieval archive, in which we store the sequencing data. Also, there is a database on structure of proteins, the ligands. Uh, similarly, uh, we have a taxonomic databases on, on NCBI. So NCBI is basically a, a vast resources having n number of databases concerning our. Uh, studies. So, uh, like we can go for the uh, this. Uh, nucleotide databases uh, uh, we can if you need to search some nucleotide concerning suppose we are going for rice we can write the uh, uh, biological name for rice and then we can just have to click on search we will get the list of all the nucleotides that are available in our rice species so this uh, gives a count about 29 lakh uh, nucleotides have been available in this uh, database for rice or you, we can go for the genomes also that are available for this particular um, species then we can have the genome set also uh, for the rice so these many people have assembled the genome sequence the genome and the files have been uh, put here uh, as a repository so this way we can uh, um, search our data uh, data from this ncbi resources now another one database that is of importance is the European Molecular Biology uh, Laboratory. Uh, this has been run by the European uh, group. Here also we have data concerning with the nucleotides, the proteins, uh, and uh, if we can search it out here, like we, if you click on this DNA and RNA, they have structures, uh, database on structures, database on ontology means the annotation of the uh, annotation part, the gene expression means the microarrays and uh, everything is here. There is a, a chemical biology database also. So proteins are here, literature is there, system biology database is here, the domain databases is here. So suppose we go for the uh, DNA and RNA. And we can see n number of resources over here. There are a few tools that could be used to analyze our databases. Like this is a homology search tool, BLAST, basic local uh, alignment search tool. Uh, similarly, this is a multiple sequence alignment tool. Means uh, 
these databases are also have also having the tools uh, which we can use for our analysis part also and similarly the data resources are available over here and you can just uh, go and search the desired results now another database that pam told was about ddbj the dna data bank of japan all these three databases ncbi embl and ddbj are interconnected uh, means this the sequence in one database is also present in another two databases so the, these could be easily uh, checked the another database uh, base that is uh, uh, there is uniprot this is also a, a widely used database uh, for the proteins it, it basically has the integration of two databases swissprot and embl so uh, we can uh, search here for any protein like uh, whatever you want to search we can search it over here and we'll get, get we will get a list of uh, proteins from all the species uh, whichever are present or you can filter out a search based upon the species like if we only want for rice we can click here for rice so we are getting only the kinases that are present in our rice species Similarly, there is a um, ensemble genome. This is a plant database. Uh, sorry, this is animal data, animal mammals database. Here we can search for the, all the data information regarding the mammal. Suppose if anybody wants to go for human, then we can go and search out for human. We will get the results from here. Similarly, we can go, uh, there is a specific database called Ensemble Plants. It is basically only for plant species. We can, suppose we, we want Arabidopsis data for Arabidopsis thaliana. We click on Arabidopsis thaliana. And here we can go out to download the DNA sequences in FASTA format. Or you can go and uh, download your genes, cDNA, non-coding RNAs, proteins, your annotation file in GFF3 format. So this way you can we can use uh, this database. Or you we can also see over see the phylogenetic overview of the genome gene families that are present in rice in Arabidopsis. Uh, so the uh, second database is this is database PDB is the structural database of protein of proteins. We can uh, search for a, a particular suppose we want to search for some pro pro proteins in the plant to uh, with the certain ID five L eight R. We can copy this ID and uh, we can just put it over here in the search bar and we will get our uh, desired result. So this is the protein structure that uh, we can download. Uh, here is the download files. We can download this uh, in a primary sequence format, means the FASTA format, or in the secondary PDB format, the structural format. So these are the various formats, uh, depending upon the tool that we are using, we can download the um, uh, this structure in that particular format. So if you, uh, we just want to overlook about the structure. We can just click on the 3D view of the structure. And this will generate our structure. This is a sequence, the primary part. And this is our uh, protein structure. So this is a mesh of structure with alpha sheets, beta, uh, alpha helix, beta sheets, uh, and a uh, few loops are there. Uh, there are a few bond, bonds that have been shown, the hydrogen bonds and the van der Waals forces, everything is there in this particular structure. So this is about the structural databases. There is one more database, Interpro, which is for the classification of protein families. Uh, we can look out for the pro uh, protein families. Suppose by, we need to search out for the proteins. We can uh, see uh, these are the protein domains that are present in, in these particular species. And we can similarly um, check out for different different uh, databases like there's a list in Interpro database. We have uh, this number of uh, data in the cath gene 3D database. We have this number of database uh, data. So this file, uh, there's a list of all the databases of uh, the protein families where we, we can see the CR results. Like super families are there. Smart is one of the database for the protein families. Procyte, Prints, uh, PFAM, all these mem has already discussed with you. These are all the examples database for the protein domains. So in this Interpro, we get all the uh, data 
concerning the uh, protein data uh, domains. So the, uh, these are basically uh, the protein database uh, bases uh, that we uh, can have. So th these are few um, mainly used databases in bioinformatics. There are va other various secondary databases uh, which can which uh, we can also uh, see, like we have Gramini. Um, Gramini database. Uh, this is basically for the plant plants, and we uh, here is the there is a genome browser. There are n number of tools that are available on the Gramini website. So uh, depending upon the um, search, we can uh, search out the databases. Depending upon our need, we can search out the databases that we uh, want to explore. So they are mainly, basically, the, the main database that we keep into count is NCBI because it is having almost information for all the data resources. So uh, this is what uh, the bioinformatics is all about, the database. And uh, we can explore any database according to our uh, need. Thank you, Jyotika. Uh, uh, in case you have any queries, uh, participants, you may ask. Thank you, ma'am, for giving excellent presentation. Uh, if anyone want to ask us, sir, please. So there is no any question. So thank you, ma'am, for giving your excellent presentation. And thank if you we ask, we will contact you. Thank you for giving valuable time, ma'am. Okay, sir. Thank you very much for patience listening. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. okay uh, the next lecture of Dr. Rama Supranian, sir, on radiation analysis. Sir has to complete the portion of his lecture on radiation. So I welcome to Dr. Amas sir for giving your lecture. The floor is yours, sir. Okay, thank you, Dr. Dilip. Uh, I hope I am audible to all. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So now uh, let us continue with the discussion on uh, this dummy variable indicator variable on the uh, main or different variable side. That is logit and tropic. When the uh, study variable or the main variable or the dependent variable is uh, categorical, then we cannot go for the usual multiple linear. We have to go for this logistic regression. So to set the stage, let us uh, first let me share my screen. So So now let us uh, see in what things will be covered in this one hour lecture. First, we will be discussing the one example on the usual multiple linear regression, wherein the dummy or the indicator variables will be occurring on the right hand side, that is as regressors or independent variables. So you can note down the six, six uh, things we will be uh, talking about. The first one is indicator variables when they are used as independent variables or in uh, regressors in a multiple linear regression model. The first thing. The six, next thing is how to use logistic regression for forecasting. The second topic. The third topic we can uh, discuss uh, how to fit a logit model on a data set. I have brought this uh, uh, green econometric analysis data set. And followed by how to calculate the marginal effects. Of course, I would have loved to uh, demonstrate marginal effect calculation by R itself, along with the variances and all, but for the time, so I have calculated by Excel itself. Then we will move on to uh, multinomial logic, logic. Then the last topic is on profit analysis. So these uh, six uh, subtopics will be covered in this lecture. The first one to uh, get an idea about how to interpret an indicator variable in a multiple linear regression setup, we are considering this example. I hope this uh, screen is visible to you all. 
this yes, data sir. set visible right because somehow in this uh, office computer in between uh, i get disconnected so you people have to interact so that uh, it is uh, both way communication is there right uh, who, who are all there of course dilip will be there right so throughout the lecture yes sir okay thank you so in case uh, i i get disconnected kindly phone phone me okay okay sir no problem okay thank you uh, so the let us have this example with y usually as the dependent variable or the main variable and x is the independent variable having continuous values and o is an categorical variable what is the data is all about the data is why you consider as the weight of poultry birds in some units and x is the age in weeks so even though i am i have written age in weeks uh, there is there are no decimals let us consider it as continuous variable so no problem no need of uh, bringing in indicator variables and o is something like origin from where these poultry birds have been reared uh so g stands for georgia b stands for virginia and w stands for wisconsin so let us have three origins from where these poultry birds have been reared so we are going to uh, fit a multiple linear regression model taking y as the dependent variable x and uh, o are as independent variables x is continuous o is categorical so because it is categorical we are bringing in the indicator variable concept here so uh, people have understood uh, about this data set any response yes sir so by name should i call now who is there prahadeeshwaran is there sujit sarkar nobody is responding i hope it is not disconnected dilip i am uh, able to communicate yes. with you right yes sir yes sir okay okay no, so now i'll sir. close this data and now let me open the corresponding r code the same file we are reading so this uh, the same data set y weight x is age and o is the origin from where those poultry birds have been reared so 13 data observations are there the first one is just number we are not going to use it so i am uh, taking it out from the data so minus one first column i am deleting so then we are going to fit a again linear model only we are not talking about logit or probit we are talking a multiple linear regression model with y as dependent x is continuous and note that o is categorical but we are introducing into the model so how we are going to do that i have not brought that i suppose no issue so now how we are going to do that uh, if there are three levels of an indicator variable here three levels are there g v and w then we have to include two indicator variables in the model 
this is one rule two indicator of dummy variable so how it is done one of the levels is taken as the base or reference category and uh, other two levels that is uh, the indicator variables if we are introducing d1 and d2 d1 is given the value one for whenever v occurs and zero otherwise and d2 will be given the value uh, one if w occurs and zero otherwise so one thing we have to keep it as base so we here let us take g as a base and r by default it arranges these letters which are categorical a by alphabetical order g comes first then v then w so g by default it takes us base or reference category so let us run this model So we have got this uh, before us. <coughs> you see, G has been taken as reference category with which we will be comparing. So that's why both the indicator variables, here it is written V and W. So rather it is, let us consider it as D1 and D2. D1 is for the first dummy variable, indicator variable, D2 for second dummy variable. Why it is written V and W? Because whenever V is occurring, it will always be one. D1 will be always one. Whenever W is occurring, D2 will always be one, zero otherwise. So this is the setup which, so, Disconnected, sir. Wait, I am calling. We he will connect. Please wait. Okay. Okay. Now I am audible, right? Yes, sir. Okay, sorry, yes, sir. some uh, issue is there with my computer or the Zoom link, I suppose. The, sorry, that Zoom software, I suppose. So now uh, again, I am sharing. So we were discussing about uh, this. I told this uh, when there are three levels of an indicator variable, then two indicator variables have to be introduced. The first one we have taken as the base category G and two indicator variables are D1 and D2. Whenever uh, B occurs, then D1 T will take always the value one, zero otherwise. Whenever W occurs, D2 will take always the value one and zero otherwise, like that it goes. Now, uh, we can change the reference level. You see re-level, reference level, to something else as well. Say if W, instead of G, we can change it to W as well. So if you are changing that, <coughs> again, we are seeing the contrast, you can see. Now W has been taken as the reference level and G and V are coming. G and V are coming in that alphabetical order. So uh, earlier we have fitted a model by taking G as the reference level. So let us see the results. So these are the results. So now uh, this X is nothing but continuous. This is intercept, X is continuous. So the same interpretation goes. X is nothing but age. So average change in the weight of uh, the poultry bird when uh, X changes by one, <coughs> one unit. Here it X is in age in weeks. So one week it is changed then the increase, then the corresponding 
uh, average change in the weight of board will be increased by 0.48 units of that weight. So agree that that is a regression definition, right? Average change in Y per unit change in X. Because X is continuous, we, uh, we are talking in terms of per unit. But in case of this categorical variable, how we interpret, we always refer to the base or reference level. What reference level we have kept? G as the reference level, Georgia, that location as a reference level. So when the rearing of the bird, poultry bird, origin of the reading of the bird changes from the Georgia origin to Virginia origin, the weight of the bird is decreased by 0.27 units. That is interpretation. And this is what, when again, we will be referring to the base category only, that Georgia. When the origin of reading of the bird is changed from Georgia origin to So very sorry. Okay, So we were here. So where were we? We, we were interpreting this uh, continuous uh, variable quotient, right? Dilip, where, where were we? Yes, sir. Sir, yes. Uh, we are, uh, you were explaining at minus value of the difference in the place where we reduce, uh, we get a change. There will be change in weight with minus 0 0.27. Okay. When it comes to 0 W, it will be maybe it will be increasing 1.91. Unit. But increasing when as compared to the if it would have been read in Georgia. Georgia. You will always have the base category as uh, Georgia origin. And if you are changing the place of rearing of the bird, then it is increased by the weight of the birds will increase by 1.91 units. So this is the interpretation. Now, once we have changed the contrast into W reference and again running the model. and getting the interpretation, you can see the same thing comes in the opposite sign. Earlier it was Georgia as reference. Now this Hello everyone, uh, there is some technical issue. He will join after five minutes. So please wait. He will join with another system.
yes sir okay sorry that is for this um... now you can start sir oh thank you so now let us uh, so that indicator variable example let us uh, jump now mainly people are asking about how to do how to get the marginal effects so for that let us directly jump into the green so this is the data set taken from this econometric analysis book green and uh, you can see there are you ignore the first uh, column that is just the number of observations so that is uh, how many 32 observations are so who are asking about marginal effects the other day who are the who was talking about marginal effects no response i am i am audible right dilip yes sir you are yes sir audible sir and who who who, who is speaking uh, sir uh, this is vijay chandra sir from us rajas acha you are asking about okay vijay chandra ji okay so now uh, there are four variables and this grade is the res response variable or the main variable and you can say that is categorical either it is ones or zeros and these are the three independent variables and independent variables also we can see two continuous and one discrete or categorical and because it is just zero and one we need not go for that including the directly this uh, because two levels of indicator variable one indicator two levels of the categorical variable so one indicator variable will be included so I, either to include so p either say itself will act as an indicator variable so so now a log model so now so this is the table which has been given in that green book uh, with variables as gpa tuce and psi and of course grade is the dependent variable which is categorical and just you fit a linear model or th that is multiple linear regression model these are the questions intercept 
plus other regression quotient. Slope, you can see as such, it is same because direct interpretation. But in case of logistic, these are the quotient. But whatever is written as slope, we'll be using this uh, formula to find marginal effects where this lambda, this is called capital lambda uh, in Greek, where this lambda is having this expression, 1 by 1 plus e4 minus z. And z will look like z is nothing but beta 0 plus beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2 plus beta 3 x3. So that is z. So instead of directly using z, we will be using 1 by 1 plus e4 minus Z for this lambda expression, one minus of the same expression. The average, average of the TUC, average of the PS. Take the average and that will use us use these 2.8. So now first we should get these uh, quotients right. For, for that, let us uh, run a program. So Dr. Dalip? Yes. There, there is continuous internet connection problem and it is a very important lecture. So we request you to rearrange this lecture on some other day with proper connectivity. Okay, ma'am. Let me discuss with sir. So now also problem is there. Sir, uh, sir sometimes sound issue is there now, no, actually. Yes, sir. Uh, it's frequently breaking and the voice yes, is yes. not coming. And we are not getting anything as it is a very important lecture and we want this lecture properly. Sorry. So, one, one, so, one, we, Dilip, I will, I will contact you and accordingly let me. Hello. Um, uh, will you people agree after 5.30 or maybe before uh, 11.30? Uh, after 5.30 is okay, ma'am. Huh? After 5.30. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Okay, so, ma uh, okay. So, we will... Madam, today or tomorrow, madam? Huh? I will I will have to... Uh, we have to ask uh, Dr. Rama, like... Uh, his madam, activity. today during working hours will be best, madam. You see how uh, working hours, we have, uh, you know, sessions till 5.30. No issue, ma'am. So, so we cannot uh, uh, interchange with the other speakers. Fine, fine, ma'am. Uh -huh. So that is not possible. Now our slots are completely uh, locked, ma'am. Okay. Uh -huh. Fine, fine. So, no issue. So, so we have two options. One is before eleven thirty, we can have ten thirty to eleven thirty someday, or it is after five thirty. So ma ma before 11.30, it will be okay as it will be in working hours. No? Uh, okay. Uh, you see, we will not go by one person this thing. You uh, may uh, decide among yourself and you let me know. Okay. Or uh, I will okay, uh, just uh, uh, share again, uh, Dilip, one uh, single uh, link you can share where they will just poll uh, before 11.30 or after 5.30. So majority, yeah. majority, right? So that link you can make and send them. Let everyone respond there, and then we will inform Dr. Ram. Uh, Ma'am, I will I will come to your institute itself. Then and there I will give lecture. Okay, because okay, no issue. Because okay, so nice. in your institute also one more training is going on as such. I think so. Uh, yes, that's why I think it might be a problem. No, 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 no. Actually, I face this thing in my office computer. There is some issue, even though I have again and again corrected it, but it is coming like that. But this, some of this voice problem is there, I suppose, into my laptop, right? Okay, okay. Uh -huh. So, in that case, like if we have to deliver 